He's often the person that um, all the ad uh, trades go to for quotes on or off the record. So thank you very much for joining us, Al. Thanks, Tracy. Good morning. Just like speed dating. Wow. And don't think the symbolism of asking me to speak about my business and having the stage on flames has escaped me. So, uh, okay. Here we are, another conference, trying to look at the future, uh, see the future. But I think the fact is, I think we know what this future looks like. I mean, you guys know this. Um, I think the real issue is how we get to the future. And that's the real challenge. And the problem is that along that road, there are a lot of potential detours that are being created by misunderstanding, by perceptions, by urban myths. And unless we can address these, the transition from present day to the TV of tomorrow will be kind of a rocky journey. So one of the biggest questions that I'm asked all the time now is where have the viewers gone? Because the assumption is that these guys have stopped watching television. And that would obviously have huge implications. Now, here are some reasons why I think people have that perception. These are just some examples of what we've seen in the press lately. And if you really begin to think about it, there are some really good reasons why people have that sense that viewers have gone away. This is Nielsen data, and it's from 2008 until 2014. It's the, it's the putt. It's the usage of the medium. It's not what they're watching. It's people who are sitting in front of a screen. And as you can see, what Nielsen reports is that among 18 to 24-year-olds, there's been in five years a 32% decline. If we look at 25 to 34s, it's a 24% decline. If we look at you know, 35 to 49, it's a 9% decline. And then as you get to the older guys, not surprisingly, things really haven't changed all that much. So there is a reason why people have this perception, but is it really real and what's really going on? Well, let me just take a step back for a minute. Back in the day, there was this saying that the A students went into medicine, the B students went into business, the D students went into television and made more money than everybody else. And this is the reason why. That's how people watch TV in those days. They could only watch it one way. There were a limited number of networks, there were a limited number of channels, and frankly, there were a limited number of programs. And the other thing I've observed is that in those days, there was a limited amount of furniture. There's only one chair for this family. There were obviously furniture challenge, but here we move on to what's going on today. And if you can't read this, the, the caption, it just says, you know, we're all together watching television, but we're not all watching TV together. And, and these issues are really being driven by two things. The first is the notion or the issue of fractionalization, and that's all about new media behaviors. It's about the amount of programming that's out there, and it's about, yes, subscription VOD, notably Netflix, and we'll talk a lot about that. And then secondly, it really is about measurement, okay? So let's just talk first about new media behaviors. Now listen, if I'm going to surprise you guys with anything I say here, you're probably at the wrong conference. We know there's a huge amount of change that's going on. But I think what, when you step back and you begin to look at the pace of the change, that's really kind of what blows you away. Secondly, it's the issue of mainstreaming. These behaviors are no longer about 25-year-olds who wear black and live in Williamsburg. They're about Americans and they're about all age groups. There's also the issue of consumer curation. And it goes so far beyond the idea of, you know, I want what I want, when I want it, where I want it. Yeah, we get that, but it's even much more granular than that. And that's what's so interesting. And finally, as I said earlier, it's about the adoption of SVOD and Netflix. So just a quick walk down sort of memory lane. You know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we did have disruption but they came far and few between, and the industry had the ability to kind of digest it and figure out what was going on. And then you get into the 80s and 90s, and you can see the pace of change and the technology began to pick up. You know, you get into 2000 to 2006, and, you know, it's pretty evident. And finally, when you get into, you know, recent history, the last six or seven years, there really isn't enough room on the slide to take all the technology and put it on out there. But, you know, let me give it to you another way. I'm a research guy. We'll take a look at numbers. If you want to take a look and see the adoption rates, how long it took a technology to reach 30% of the country, what's really interesting is that people don't remember that the PC 
actually took 12 years, they were off the chart, to reach that 30%. When it came to VCRs, it took about five years. When it came to the DVD, it took three years. And now the tablet, it's taken two and a half. So this stuff is happening really, really quickly. And I think the way I like to look at this stuff is generationally. And the reason is, I really believe that you are the media you grew up with. So, if you take a look at baby boomers, and they're sort of ages 57 to 66, um, well actually they're alpha boomers, they're the leading edge of the baby boom. These guys grew up with three TV networks. I know, it, you know, I show this to people and they can't believe that it's such a time. The transistor radio, before that, music really wasn't portable. You know, and obviously print, newspapers, and magazines. And then when you get to the next generation, beta boomers, the trailing end of the baby boom, what you have is these guys grew up with everything on the left, plus they grew up with the remote control, they grew up with color TV, they had six TV channels, amazing, and they had FM radio. And then you get into Generation X, again, everything on the left, but they also grew up with cable, VCR, MTV, by that I mean niche cable networks that appeal to a very particular audience interest. There were an average of 33 channels, there were CDs, which made music even more portable, and there was satellite radio. And then you get into the ever popular millennials, 23 to about 32, they never knew a time without a hundred or more channels, without a DVR and DVDs, without the internet or texting, without video games. Media portability was huge, and of course, social networking was a part of their lives. And then you get to Gen Z, which is going to be our future. They had everything in the past, but these guys never knew a time without an iPad, without Spotify or Pandora, without Facebook or Twitter, without smartphones, without Netflix streaming and really without on demand. And if you think about it, I would make an argument that people under kind of 30 no longer understand why they have to wait a week to see the next episode of a favorite TV show. They just don't get it. They just don't understand why it's not there for them right now. And another way to look at this is we ask people, it's one of my favorite questions over time, we give them a choice of all kinds of media and we say, which are the two that you can't live without? For baby boomers in 2009, it was TV number one, print number two, internet number three. And this isn't about their use, it's about their sort of psychological engagement with it. By the time you get to 2014, you can see that the PC laptop becomes number one, TV number two, smartphone is number three. And then for Gen X, they were also very TV-centric back in 2009, but as you notice, uh, TV is now a third choice, PC laptop, smartphone number two. Then you get into the millennials, PC laptop cell, and TV, by the time you get to 2014, the cell is just replaced by the smartphone. And then you get into Gen Z, these guys really don't care all that much about TV. It's PC, smartphone, and video games. And again, it's not their use of the medium, it's how much they're attracted to it. And so these have had huge influences in terms of the way people behave. So the first thing it's kind of interesting to notice is just time shifting trends. Back in 08, 09, 83% of television in seven days was watched live, 8% same day, and, and you can see the long tail was rather small. By the time you get to uh, this time, it's about 35% less live viewing, about 109% more si same day, and obviously the long tail is growing. I wouldn't care where they watch it if it wasn't for the fact that some of these aren't being measured and we're not getting credit for it, and that's what's kind of troublesome. So. Going on, again, to show you some sense of curation, oh, and by the way, 4Net Primetime Entertainment was time shifted 46% this year versus 42% last year, and that's kind of huge. One of the ways people time shift, of course, is the DVR, and the way you read this chart is simply this. On top, you know, uh, on top is the rating, the average rating in prime time for DVR playback. What you see across is the percentage of penetration, and what you'll notice is that in the past couple of years, penetration of DVRs has remained flat. The fact of the matter is, anybody who wants a DVR has one, and if you don't have one, it's because you don't want it. But what's kind of interesting is that the use has continued to go up. And this is what is kind of interesting as well. This is the four net average, the average of the four broadcast networks in prime time. And what you can see is that that's been going down consistently, and for some reason it's not rendering, but that, um, that 1.3 belongs in the circle. There it is on the left, it escaped. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, um, DVR playback in prime time is not only the largest, quote, network, 
It's also five times larger than the other four networks combined. And that's the consumer curating. Other ways people get their stuff? Well, there's VOD. These are the transactions. This is the amount of time spent. In both cases, it's, it's double-digit growth. And then you get into the ever-popular video streaming, the time spent per month. And you can see that, you know, it's a hockey stick. We went from, you know, 1.5 average hours per month in 2008 to 28 average, and this is average, of course, but in the past year alone, it's a 47% increase. Again, I know this doesn't surprise any of you, it's just the amount and the pace of change, which is, I think, pretty extraordinary. The thing that's also interesting is people have gotten much more sophisticated about the content they want to stream. As you can see, the streaming of TV programs has consistently gone up, the streaming of movies has gone up, and the streaming of user-generated content has gone down. People are much less interested in watching cats chase their tails than they are in looking at premium content. It doesn't matter where it comes from, it's just that it's a, it's a different kind of content. And then you get into the streaming of TV shows and movies, okay? Overall, in total, in the past seven days, how many people reported they streamed a TV or a movie? And you can see it went from 44 to 50% in just one year. But not surprisingly, there is a younger skew to this behavior. For young guys, it's 65%, middle age, it's 50%, and older folks, it's 33%. But here's the deal. One third of people over 50 who report streaming at least once in the past seven days is not insignificant. And then another thing we were interested in is tell us which of the platforms that are available to you are the two sources that you can't live without. What's kind of interesting and not surprising is that live TV remains the major source that people say they can't live without. But the number two source is Netflix, streaming Netflix. It went from 19% uh, percent to 28% percent in just one year, and that's an increase of 9%. And then you have the DVR, or a TiVo, in other words, another time-shifting curation device, which went from 23 to 27, an increase of 4%. All the other um, platforms, you know, are relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, the aggregator sites are even, you know, rather down. And by the way, I don't have it on the chart here, but, but piracy is actually only about 4% and really hasn't grown. So the fact of the matter is people are straightening up as long as they can access this stuff. One of the ways in which this is having an impact is what everybody is aware of, of course, it's the whole notion of binge or marathon viewing. But again, it's really not that they're doing it, it's that how many people and how many are doing it so frequently. So what you have here in total, overall, in the, you know, among all viewers, 22% say they're doing it frequently, 45% occasionally, it's over two thirds. You know, once again, for young guys, 83% are doing it 35, 68% uh, among the middle-aged guys, and again, among the 50-plus audience, it's still just about half. So the notion of binge viewing is clearly here. It's, it's a way people have decided to consume certain programs. From our point of view, if you're an advertiser-supported medium, binge viewing to some extent basically hurts your ability at this point to uh, monetize the viewing because by definition people are watching it outside of that seven day window but stuff that you just heard a few minutes ago and stuff that was going upstairs will tell you that as we can get to more um, uh, uh, targeted uh, dynamic advertising insertion some of these monetizable issues will go away so that's behavior the other thing is amazing Oh, these are the top sources for binge viewing. No surprise, Netflix, DVR, on-demand TV channels. Next area is program content. There has been an explosion of content. It really is quite startling. Years ago, I used to do this thing where I'd call the Chamber of Horrors, showing people how much stuff was going on. And when we talked about how many channels Nielsen reported measuring, this is just reported measuring, it was like 200, 210. Well, here we are now. Nielsen is reporting on 1,160 channels, but of course, they don't report on many, many other channels that people have access to, you know, notably Netflix. But here's another way to take a look at that growth, okay? It's a growth in cable programming. So in 1999-2000, there were 45 networks, and they programmed about 50,000 hours of original programs a year. 
as you can see, that that grew over the years to 61 networks, 83 networks, and then finally, right now, there are 115 networks programming almost 120,000 hours of new programming. That's a 241% increase in the amount of hours. It's a 255% increase in the amount of networks. There's just a huge amount of stuff that's out there. How many channels can people get? Again, these are averages, so it's much lower than most of you would think about. But according to Nielsen, basically in 2008, uh, the average home received about 129 channels. And then by the time we get to 2013, that grew to 189, or 46% increase. But here's what's really interesting. Human beings have an issue with having too much choice. So those red bars tell you the average number of channels that are viewed by a home. And as you can see, it's really been about 17 to 20, 21. Now, they're all different. And you may have one set of, you know, your menu is one different than somebody else's. But the fact of the matter is, the amount of viewing about all this sort of stuff tends to be relatively small. The fact is, though, that everybody has different menus, and therefore there's this huge fractionalization because people aren't always consuming the same thing other people are. And then you get into the thing that's getting just a huge amount of conversation, and that is subscription video on demand, or in this case, it's mainly Netflix. And here's, the, uh, here's basically the trend. Okay, Netflix has had an amazing growth. I mean, it goes to the first quarter, it was almost 36 million. If you take a look at Amazon, they don't release data, and it's Amazon Prime, so you get TV, and we'll also ship your packages for free. So it's a little bit misleading, but again, just to get a sense of what's going on, and Hulu is about 5 million. But Netflix came out with a report very recently that said that they're now in about 40 million homes, or they have 40 million subscribers. So there's just no question that Netflix is a huge, um, is a huge player in this world and is obviously having some major disruptive impact on the way in which people are consuming TV. Again, Netflix at this point isn't really being measured, and so you really don't have a sense of what it is. We've read a lot about stuff, and there's been research that was just reported yesterday, which I mean is very consistent with what we found, and that is that shows like Orange is the New Black and, uh, and uh, House of Cards, they, I mean, they, they get a lot of press and a lot of attention, but they account for a very, very small proportion of what people are watching on Netflix. What they're really watching on Netflix is an awful lot of television programming that have been sold to them by broadcast networks and by cable. Did people use SVOD in the past seven days? Yep, 22% increase overall. And once again, you can see somewhat of a younger skew among 18 to 34, a 10% increase among 35 to 49. And here's what's interesting. The absolute number of 50 plus people is 24%. It's obviously the lowest group, but they had the largest growth. And so there you go. But the impact of content access on TV is really interesting. Uh, what people say is that having several ways to watch TV makes me want to keep up with more shows. And similarly, with all the ways to watch my favorite shows, I'm watching more now than in the past. So the fact of the matter is that this SVOD or Netflix is kind of a frenemy, it's a double-edged sword, it really plays in a lot of different ways, but what it does help to do is increase interest in viewing and increase engagement in some of our programs. And that takes me to probably the most important thing I'm gonna to talk to you about today, and that is the issue of measurement. You know, we are what we basically produce, and we produce ratings, that's what we produce. If you can't measure it, you can't sell it, you can't uh, understand it, you can't advertise it. And so, once again, I'll just bring you to the slide I showed you early with these huge declines among you know, audiences. And you might say, well, the world is really falling. But the reality is somewhat different, OK? What we did here was take the linear Nielsen rating. That's in the blue box. We added on the non-Nielsen measured platforms, things that at this point Nielsen isn't capable of measuring, but is measured by a variety of sources and tried to give it a Nielsen, basically, apples to apples approach. And what you find there is instead of having a 34% decline, the use of the medium went from 19 to 25, almost 26. It was a 36% increase. So it's not like 32% of these guys, I mean, you know, that these guys are watching 32% less of the medium. In fact, they're watching more. They're just watching it in different places. 
And the same thing is true for 25 to 34, it's a 27% increase, and then you have a 15% increase among the middle guys, and then, you know, basically no real change significantly with older folks now because they still are much more oriented toward linear TV, but that's going to change. But here's the deal. This really wouldn't be all that interesting except to research geeks my, like me, except that it has a huge implication for how we evaluate programs. So let me show you why what you see in ratings is not what you're really getting. This is the blacklist, and this is this season. The blacklist couldn't be a more gold standard poster child of a broadcast network show that's very, very broad, okay? So the day after the show is aired, there's a live same rating, and that's a 2.8. And then five days later, the live three rating, the, the time shifting that took place over three days comes in, and that rating goes to a 4.3. And then when you go out seven days, the rating goes to a 4.7. But as Billy Mays, the great pitchman on TV would say, but there's more, because the fact of the matter is, there's another 19% of consumption of that week's episode that isn't being seen by Nielsen. It comes from all of these non-Nielsen measured sources, PC, laptop, smartphone, game console, over-the-top device, and so on. And by the way, that 19% equates to 1.4 million 18 to 49 viewers who aren't being counted. I mean, they're there, but they're basically invisible. And if I go to a show like uh, Parenthood, a very similar kind of uh, uh, pattern uh, emerges, a 1.3 live, a 2.1 L3, a uh, 2.3 on L7, and there it's about 23%. 23% of the viewing to that show, and this is not clips, this is the full show, is not being measured. And then I'll show you an extreme, and this is Parks and Recreation. Parks is a niche program, it's not a huge show, but just check this out, 1.2 live, 1.6 three days later, 1.7 live seven, but 37%, 37% of people who watched that episode watched it on platforms that aren't a part of the Nielsen ecosystem. And if you think that this is just an NBC universal problem, what you're gonna see here is that it also applies to, uh, to Fox. That's just the new girl. My friends at Fox told me that. So let me just finish this way. The answer to the question where is the audience gone is really simple. They really haven't gone anywhere. They still watch TV, but in most cases, now more than ever, they're just watching it differently. Look, predicting the future is hard, but one thing I'm sure of is that these changes in behaviors are very real, they're very permanent, and they're gonna grow rapidly, but we can't stop this future, but we can manage it. And in my business, we're gonna try to do that by promoting and recognizing that we do have some very, very powerful assets. It means we don't run away from the term television. Okay, we might have to redefine it, but it's because we'd make a huge mistake not to embrace it still, because it's one of the few things, that is television, that ultimately is what continues to differentiate us in an increasingly crowded and disruptive media environment. And so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks very much.